Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Yossi. Uh, and deep uh, love for Ron Lapide and his family. Thanks for all you've done. I'm going to switch this whole thing around a little bit because it um, make it more of a humanistic side of things. Because I've worked with uh, governments all over the world when it came down to push and shove, which was something that I had to do, was push and shove. I started my long career in birds uh, 70 years ago, 70, when my grandfather taught me how to raise fighting chickens. Money for him, experience for me. I wasn't raised by a father who was I wasn't raised by a father, I was raised by my grandfather. And as time went on, I became more and more engendered with individuals not caring much about what was going on on our continent. And at Hawk Mountain, I started working with humans there in 19, well, a long time ago. And it was because of meeting individuals like Leshem and like Matsahavi uh, that I learned that there was a more humanistic side to saving birds. <clears throat> and while I was not coached in how to save birds physically, I saved them humanitarianly wise, humanitarian wise, starting with uh, human species, because I started a program at Hawk Mountain when it was still a mom and pop organization, an organization run by two very old people who finally had to be removed from that institution, uh, which was sad, but we had to do it anyway. And we were working for hardly any money. Uh, we had a job which was called TNT. <coughs> TNT, trash and toilets, and that's what we built our empire on. But it wasn't until I started to learn about Leshem and the Israel and what he was doing with the, on the humanistic side of things, uh, getting people involved, that I decided I would travel over here, I think in 1982, to a conference on birds of prey in Thessaloniki, Greece, and met Yossi. And it was a whole change of venue for me to begin to involve people. Um, and while I loved birds, and I was raised on birds um, in a different sort of way, it was because of Yossi's influence that I changed the way things would happen. So you know you get a, a call in the middle of the night, midnight, and Yossi's on the other end of the line saying, Jim, you've got to do something about the Voice of America Towers. Okay, relax. I mean, one thing Yossi doesn't do is relax. <laughs> so I got on the phone the next morning and I called friends who were friends of the sanctuary, Mike Kalajarakis, George Stephanopoulos, two Greeks from New York City. And I'm sure you know, or you may not know, the name Stephanopoulos, who became Bill Clinton's, one of Bill Clinton's cabinet members. So that morning I took a bus to New York, went up to, uh, on, across from Central Park, and spoke with a psychiatrist, not because I needed it. Um, fellow by the name of Kalajarakis, who was a very personal friend of Reverend George Stephanopoulos' dad. And I said, uh, incidentally, we had traveled to Africa together, uh, that's a psychiatrist, and uh, I said, I need help, and I need it today, and I need it right now, and I need you to get Stephanopoulos to introduce me to someone in Washington in the, in the Clinton cabinet, and I need you to introduce me to to Bill Clinton. 
because it's the only person that I know that can make this thing happen. I can reverse the voice of America Tower construction. 300 towers going up in the Arva? It would have spelled doom to the life there. And I was in touch with Dr. Zahavi over many years coming here and just being around him. And so the morning I went to New York, the following morning I was taking another bus to New York to the Capitol to talk to Stephanopoulos. And Stephanopoulos in the following morning was in Clinton's office. And on the third morning I had a call from Bill Clinton's office saying, don't worry Jim, there will be no voice of America Towers. We're stopping it today. Whoa, pretty good. <laughs> so we went on to do other fancy things in the birddom. Um, I was privileged enough to be able to work with Noel Snyder, uh, who I think some of you know. If not, you should. Noel Snyder was the godfather of the California Condor Project. Um, and was the personal, I think, person I think responsible for saving that species from extinction. And the beauty of that whole situation was is that Snyder and I were born in the same village. We do have villages in Pennsylvania. Um, and he and I worked together on other projects, but to give you some idea of how wild this person was and how more wild we both were together, he was going to getting his bachelor's degree in, at uh, Ursinus College in Pennsylvania. He graduated on Saturday with, uh, with a BS degree, summa cum laude. And on Sunday morning, he was at Curtis Institute of Music getting his professional cellist certificate. Now well, that's unheard of for a Pennsylvania Dutch farmer. Cellist in one hand and birds in the other. And what he was doing before birds is he was taking snails, watching snails migrate through a maze, grinding the snails up in a Cuisinart, feasing the ground up snails to snails that weren't ground up, and watching to see what happened. And those snails that ended up in, as food learned how to migrate through the maze without anything other than a diet of ground up snails. This man was crazy. So he went from snails to Everglade kites to thick billed parrots and a couple of other species and then ended up, we worked together on the California condor because the zoos, as you probably remember this, and San Diego Zoo and Los Angeles Zoo were fighting with each other to try to get their names in the, in the ring so that they would be held accountable for the condor for other reasons than what was necessary and that was for protection. And so Snyder and I, he was in working in, in Los Angeles, I was at Hawk Mountain. I would get calls from, from Snyder like I, got calls from Yossi and saying, you've got to come out here tomorrow or the next day because we've got to save these condors. <coughs> and you can only do it by going to the Fish and Wildlife Service office or Audubon office and raising royal hell with a voice that is not going to be respected, I think, very much in professional world, but we made it work there, I made it work there. And we were able to get permits ended and new permits installed or yes, told, and uh, we were able to, to get the condor listed. And we started out with five condors in the wild, five condors, and now there are over 400. It's because, you know, you had so much chutzpah um, that you were able to work your way through these government offices and don't let them shit all over you. And if you didn't like it, you weren't to be in that field. You were supposed to be doing fashion work in New York City and lipstick ads and things like that. 
So I had this whole sequence of slides here that I, I don't even know, I think I should still use them. I don't know what else was on here. I guess that's me. Huh? This one? Oh, Lord. I'm going to go through these quickly because they just don't mean a damn thing. Uh, it shows a couple of us the day we had the biggest broad wing hawk flight in the history of the sanctuary when there were over 22,000 broad wing hawks came by the lookout on that day. And the kid down front is my youngest son, and he became a very good friend of Ron Lapide's. And Ron Lapide hosted him on a flight on coming down from uh, Ben Gurion. No, from uh, where was where was our Kia flight out of? I forgot. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, there. And he Matthew was 12 or 13 at the time. And he was guiding a group from Hawk Mountain on three planes um, to come to see the migration and to tour Israel. And as the door opened, on the first plane that landed, the door opened and there was my kid standing there. It was his good friend piloting the plane. Okay. We go through these. We have an inter had an intern program, still do, where I would invite people coming from all over the world to serve a three or four month stint on the lookout, learning about birds of prey and their migration, <coughs> and also about teaching kids about nature in the Appalachian Mountains. See these, I'm really, okay, I'm not gonna keep apologizing for the sequence of events here. This is uh, the first time I met Yossi was at this Raptor meeting in Thessaloniki in northern Greece. On the top of the, this fiat is me, and then the woman down below is Janet Chase, and then Mark Fuller, I know Jim Mosier, and uh, Butch Ollendorf, and Henkel, and another, these people were all working for Fish and Wildlife in some way or another. And now three of them, three of them are, have passed away. This, oh wow, this is, um, you see that wonderful sweater that Yossi gave me to wear. <laughs> um, I was embarrassed, but what would you do? With? And aside of me is Azaria alone and uh, Felix Mendelssohn, Heinrich, Heinrich Mendelssohn. And we were meeting with um, Shimon Perez about the work that SPNI was doing, uh, especially with uh, bird strikes. And so it was this man down front here who is responsible for doing so, so much in this country. We should be very proud of him. I think we should give him a round of applause before I finish. Okay. I've been putting up with your stuff all week now. Give me a couple of minutes. <laughs> Another photograph of uh, a secretive flyway where birds of prey were in jeopardy and trying to uh, convince uh, Shimon Perez to do something differently as far as migration was concerned, as far as airstrikes, as far as flight patterns. This is a very special friend and uh, a, an intern of mine. Incidentally, do I have time yet, Yossi? How much time do I have left? Six minutes. Six minutes. Oh, good. This is Anna Giordano, who is from Sicily, and who came to Hawk Mountain because she was where learn. She wanted to learn how to do a little bit more about the birds being shot as they were coming over from Tunisia. And um, I was there for two, three weeks, and this is, these were pictures taken after that, but Ana Giordano got out of her small Fiat, F-I-A-T, fix, fix It Again Tony car, I guess they call it, um, 
and as she went into, into the grocery store to buy some food for that day's work, uh, the, the car was firebombed. Had she been in there, um, 30 seconds later, she'd have been killed. And when she came to Hawk Mountain and was studying how to do things in education with birds, she got worried because she was away from her birds and needed to be there, so we had to let her go and go home. And this was a Chevron, or a, an award she was given by the Rolex uh, watch people for the wonderful work, she, and continues to do that wonderful work there. Um, I'm not going to. It's John Ledger and Yossi and uh, me and. Okay, it's no good. Um, and you recognize Dr. Mendelssohn and Dr. Leshem on top of the North Lookout, which is not a very big mountain. It's 2,400 feet high. It has over, during a year's time, over 150,000 people come there on a Sunday afternoon to watch hawks. And I think that's, uh, he Yossi was invited over for our 50th anniversary and gave a keynote talk. <coughs> now we, there are 381 trainees now at this time from 81 countries that study there. We built a wonderful visitor center and a, another center for conservation learning, uh, which serves not only scientists, but the youngsters coming over from all over the world. And um, I fly out of here tomorrow, and on Friday I fly to Tanzania to pick up my daughter, who I just adopted. And she'll be coming to Hawk Mountain as a science trainee. We also have been working with um, Tanzania National Park Association because of the danger of uh, the government allowing soda ash to be mined on Lake Natron. I think you're probably aware of that. I'm not sure. Lake Natron's a soda lake uh, right next to an active volcano. The active volcano is Oldonio Langai. And um, so this gentleman who was used to be director of national parks, his name was Lota Melamari, asked me if I could go down and find out what was happening, to uh, screaming and yelling and being a nice person, to have the government pull the mining permit from the Indian government to save that population of lesser flamingos. And one of the last projects, Caracara, in, in where is that, uh, Granada? Because we have a, an in, a person I hired uh, 20 years ago at Hawk Mountain, uh, Keith Bildstein, who is now running vulture programs all over the, all over the world. So here uh, on the left is Melania, my new daughter, and me, and uh, a friend of ours, Catherine um, Maigie. And the man on the right is, was an intern at, or Hawk, at Hawk Mountain, a trainee at Hawk Mountain in 1994, and came back in 1970 for the, the golden anniversary and was a keynote speaker, and will be coming back this year again. Uh, he's now, um, I'm going to just close off with this. I, I drove down, coming down off the Rift Valley one afternoon, and I drove into Lake Marniara National Park. And uh, sitting on a rock at the entrance to the park was Mikey, this man here, David Mikey. And I said, and he's crying. I said, Mikey, what's wrong? He said, I can't be here any, any longer because the government, the director of the national park system there wants me to be on a poaching patrol to carry AK-47 up into the forest to shoot anybody who, who I deem as a poacher. And he wasn't like that. He couldn't do that. It wasn't in his heart to do it. He was an educator. He was a bird watcher. So I went back to town, and I was able to get into the present executive director of, Na of National Parks. I said, look, Jukazi, this guy spent most of his life with working with birds and people. We can't have him working with, as a poaching agent. 
So they were able to say, okay, we, we see what you're saying. We now, and we moved them. So they moved them to Terengary National Park, which is one of the highest strongholds of elephants in, in that country. And uh, he's now been changed. He's now been promoted to warden in charge of tourism. So that worked. Ah. Now wait a minute, just give me one more minute. <laughs> I don't see anyone leaving, do you? Easy. So then we, one other last problem, project I have is in 2000 and, uh, 2007, I, I found f footprints in lava uh, as I was looking for the flamingos and then went on to develop a program where these footprints now, when we found 12 or so footprints in 2007, we've now located up to 450 of different tribes that were migrating through Africa up into the Salal, across the Red Sea and, and all points of the parts of the world. And there's a photograph of, that was incidentally in a Ju July National Geographic 2013 uh, that featured this footprint project. And that's the volcano, only active volcano in the country that it, in fact uh, erupted last year. Oops. Okay, that's enough. Um, thanks.